Hello, and welcome to the Cybersecurity Awareness Forum, folks. Uh, this is session number 25 uh, on carrots and sticks, motivating employees in a security awareness program. I'm Scott Wright, the security awareness experience guy, I guess. Um, I help businesses build a more engaging and effective security awareness program. And I also happen to be CEO of ClickArmor, which sponsors this series. ClickArmor is the original interactive security awareness training platform that uses gamification to educate and employ, uh, engage employees to reduce cyber risks. So I'm really happy that uh, everybody's joining us. We've got a great panel uh, today. Um, I'll start by just telling you a little bit about uh, why this is such an important topic for me in particular. I've been teaching security awareness for the last 15 years and worked with a lot of organizations and some have used more carrots uh, to motivate people into training and other activities, while others have used more sticks uh, to try and pound people into submission. Uh, it can be really frustrating to see employees not responding the way you want them to. And maybe it's because of how you're trying to motivate them. So you might have a strong opinion on when it's best to use carrots versus sticks. So we want to hear your opinions in the chat. And we have some amazing panelists here that are uh, going to be able to provide their insights. But uh, I want to start by having everybody who's on the call, if you can, just type in where you're coming from around the world. Uh, love to hear uh, where uh, people are joining us uh, from. It's it's a great international audience that we tend to have on, on each uh, day. So uh, I want to start by introducing our panel uh, very quickly, and then I will... Uh, start with a little bit of a different approach to what we've done before. I uh, want to make sure we maximize the value for people, streamline it, and, and make the best use of our time. So uh, we're going to start with uh, a quick uh, introduction. You've got them handy, Ryan. Why don't you uh, introduce our yeah. panelists? Just give me a one quick second. I'm uh, Ryan Healy Ogden. Um, I am the uh, Director of Cybersecurity Solutions here at uh, ClickArmor. And uh, I am uh, always pleased to be on this panel. So on today's panel, uh, we've got Erin Gallagher. Welcome, Erin. It's her first panel. Uh, she's been working in the security awareness field for five years. Uh, she has helped build programs for companies ranging from 1,200 employees to 500,000. Erin has a true passion for maintaining the human connection in all things security and awareness. Uh, Sid, thank you for joining us, Sid. He is a, a repeat panelist. He's currently the head of IT at Greenpeace Canada and studying for the CISSP. He has worked in the nonprofit and corporate sectors and ran his own IT services business for over 15 years. Next up, we've got Jim. Jim's a 20-year veteran in the information technology and information security field who has worked for or with many different organizations in many different industries. He's currently a senior vice president of digital security operations and customers bank and hosts a weekly cybersecurity news podcast. And Tyler, I believe, is to be on the panel as well today. Tyler's a cybersecurity and telecom specialist and account manager at Global CTI, empowering California businesses with tech solutions. I guess we better upgrade Tyler to panelist. And I think we also have uh, Danny from Greenpeace. Um, we'll be uh, a very full panel. So uh, while we're uh, waiting for Danny to join, I uh, just wanted to do the quick roundtable to see uh, where people are coming from. As I said, John from the UK, Stephen from Stittsville, uh, Ontario, uh, Ryan from Romera, Ontario, uh, Autumn from San Jose. That's great. And Thea from Oslo. Excellent. Good to see you, Theo. Uh, Thea. And uh, we have Minnesota, we have Montreal, Ottawa, Victoria, BC. Illinois, Philadelphia, Tampa, Calgary, Toronto, amazing, New York City. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining. Uh, so now that we've got that sort of out of the way, uh, I'm going to start by uh, just bringing people into uh, the context here. Uh, I'll share my screen. I do this uh, sometimes. Usually I, I did this after we did uh, some uh, polls, but uh, we want to get this uh, rolling and get some meet into the conversation uh, as quickly as possible and also get people on, on the same page. So um, first, really quickly, want to let you know what we do with these uh, cybersecurity awareness forum sessions. We record them. Uh, they're all on our YouTube channel. We also do uh, uh, blog posts based on the transcripts uh, so that there's some insights uh, on our website. And we also uh, issue a quarterly report, which summarizes a lot of the insights and quotes from these uh, sessions um, on a quarterly basis. So we'll have the second quarter one out very soon. We have Q1 available now on our website at clickarmor.ca. 
and Click Armor does sponsor this set of um, uh, forum discussions. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Click Armor in, in a minute. But uh, we've introduced our panelists. Uh, we have Aaron, Sid, Ryan, Jim. We also have Tyler and Danny as well. So let's uh, dive into the concept of uh, carrots and sticks motivating employees. I just want to put a little bit of context around this. So there are behavior models out there. You might have heard uh, some uh, academic uh, research or uh, models put out. Uh, one's called the Fog Behavior Model by B.J. Fogg. Um, really well known, and it's it's referenced a lot when it comes to education and programs to get people engaged. Uh, it's an interesting model because it focuses on three aspects. There's um, the motivation, there's the uh, ability uh, on the horizontal axis, and then there are the prompts. And basically what it's saying is that at any given point a situation for an employee, for example, or an individual, um, if they are uh, at a certain level of ability uh, and they have a certain level of motivation to do it something uh, innately or inherently, and then there are some prompts that might help them uh, take some action that we want them to take. And this curve sort of represents the relationship between the level of ability and their motivation uh, and when we need prompts and when we think prompts will succeed. So it's a really interesting model. Uh, and I think it, it's certainly applicable, but I don't know that it's always uh, actionable or, or practical. So one that I wanted to actually uh, tell people about is really what I've used over the last several years to create the program and platform that, that we have. Um, that model is called Octalysis, and it's built around gamification, as you might have guessed, because we're uh, very focused on gamification at Click Armor. But I think it's really relevant when we think about security awareness and all of the different things, that, the levers that we have to engage people. And we will probably talk a lot about the carrot side, trying to make sure that we um, are doing things that motivate people properly rather than with negative types of things. But there are some times when you actually might want to use a little bit of uh, negative consequences to motivate people. And I, that's what I like about the Octalysis model, because it does have um, some really good tools, but it actually tells you, be careful using these particular things, because they can actually have negative impacts overall uh, in the long term. So I have a QR code here. You can go and visit uh, the website that talks about Octalysis. So I wanted to just sort of start by sharing those models because it, it all comes down to behavior. We want to get people moving uh, and taking action in certain ways. And so we have to have some expectation. If we do certain things, what do we expect them to do? And having a, a little model that tells us, you know, if we want people to do certain things, it might help if we try something. So in a minute, I'm going to uh, start showing a, a poll. Um, we've got three poll questions here listed that we're going to jump into, but uh, I think what I'll do is focus on the first poll question um, that was actually done on LinkedIn. And I'm going to let the panelists uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, you know, their views on what the question uh, was about and also what the results might be that um, they see and, and comment a little bit about it. So the poll that we did on LinkedIn was what are the most cost, uh, most effective carrots that you've seen as low cost motivators for security awareness programs? So when we talk about low cost, meaning we don't have to shell out a lot for uh, monetary kinds of rewards, we're looking at ways to motivate people through those uh, less expensive and more positive types of uh, reinforcement. So the, the options that I put in here, they're kind of limited because of the way LinkedIn polls work. You don't get a lot of space and you only get four options. So the question, the options were published achievements and awards. Uh, there was making experiences enjoyable and there was offering friendly assistance and there were leaderboards. And so it was interesting to see, you know, we had 16 votes um, and there's, you know, a pretty clear trend towards the published achievements and awards being pretty high uh, in terms of the belief that people have that it, they will be uh, most effective. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to the panel. I think one of the things that we'll do a little bit differently this time, because we especially have a, a lot of panelists, uh, any panelists who have a particular opinion or want to ask a question or share a thought, um, if you can use the uh, raise your hand feature in Zoom, then Ryan will make sure that we get to your uh, comment or question. And that way we don't have to circle around asking people if they have comments. So um, if that makes sense to everybody, um, Ryan, do we have 
Anybody who wants to go first on commenting on this particular poll? Yeah, we've got Jim. Jim? Thanks. So this is a great question. And it's one of those things where you got to kind of take it for, you know, as where it's at. You know, some people like that award stuff. So, you know, going out and doing this in front of, you know, most organizations have like some kind of presentation, I think is a real motivator for some people. Though I do know some of the younger generation tends to uh, skew fake awards mean nothing, you know, give me something in return. Um, But I would say out of the options that were there, the best is, is to publicly acknowledge people who do a good job, even if it's just a paper certificate you print out from, uh, you know, the office products that just has their name on it. It's something that um, they get. Uh, It's the same as the other option with leaderboard. Some people like that, uh, seeing my name at the top, you know, a lot of different things do it rather than security. I know my my health insurance company does it for my organization where it's kind of, you know, move to the top. You get your name there. You get award points for doing things. Some people that's a great motivator for. So you have to really understand your audience and what motivates them. Um, but those are my two options. I think, that, you know, in my experience that I've seen in organizations that seem to work the best, either a leaderboard that gives them something to, well, I beat John from accounting again, or uh, 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 an igno- it's not just the certificate itself. It is the acknowledgement at a public function that you've done good that uh, motivates some people. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Erin? Uh, so I want to actually piggyback on what Jim just said. Um, it is a mix of all of those. You can't succeed in any one particular one of those answers because everybody's motivation is different. And I work specifically in security awareness. So my entire job is focusing on adjusting and changing human behavior. And if there's anything I've learned from 1,200 to 500,000 people, everybody is motivated differently. Just like everybody can be an extrovert, an introvert, an omnivert. Everybody has different ways that they feel like they're being rewarded for changing behavior. Um, But I will say one of the most effective ways that I found that works for a lot of people is actually making uh, experiences enjoyable. And my best example of that is uh, everybody's biggest pain point as an end user being phishing and phishing simulations. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people, not in my organizations, but outside that they don't like phishing simulations because it feels deceptive and it feels like you're just tricking your employees and there's no real benefit to it. But we've been able to make that adjustment to make that a more pleasurable experience for people by rewarding people with a certificate. Just a quick, good job, you reported a fish, Um, keep up the good work. And we would just send that directly to them in an email. Um, Even the, we always did susceptible user briefings after we had people fall susceptible. We didn't like to use the word fail, it's a little aggressive. But uh, when people were found susceptible, we'd invite them to an optional session to learn more about phishing. And we always started off that session with, you're not in trouble. We're always here to help you and we wanna make sure that you know the door is open for us to answer any questions and we're more than happy to help. So I found that making experiences more enjoyable definitely does change people's attitudes and um, behaviors towards security in general. Awesome. Thank you very much, Aaron. That's great insight. Uh, I would have to agree with both, you know, Jim and Aaron on this as well. I think I would probably put enjoyable first, um, right then with the human element. I, it's a tough uh, of that achievement one. Uh, humans like to be rewarded for their hard work, especially in, in today's day and age, but they also like to have a little bit of enjoyment amongst a work day. So it's like, which one will drive them further? So great insights. I'm going to hand this off to Sid next. So I'd like to, I, I agree with Aaron that in my opinion, making experiences enjoyable is, is fundamental. Um, regarding published achievements and awards, if these are um, available in some public forum, if it's attached to your profile in the HR system, it can, for people who have not completed it for some reason, it can kind it can be a stick. I, I think it, and I don't know, you know, it's like a, there's a negative connotation to not having that, that, that badge next to your name. Um, if it is published uh, um, publicly 
um, and that is something people should think about. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point as well. I mean, there's always the flip side. We can, if we're, if we're going to continuously promote people and, and talk about how great they are, there's always going to be that subset that isn't achieving that. So how are they reacting to watching that message? Right. And that's kind of maybe, you know, to what Taryn's point though, where they, she mentioned that people that are not failing, but maybe aren't achieving the ex expected results, you know, they're, they're not uh, in trouble, but they are just encouraged and brought up. So you can't ignore that subset uh, because yeah, that could have very negative uh, consequences to Sid's point. Uh, hand this off to Tyler. Yeah. I wanted to, to piggyback on the, uh, the leaderboard sites or the public, you know, achievement um, to me, that's, that's, you know, been a double-edged sword in, in a good way in terms of you're getting to provide positive social feedback to people um, that are doing well. And, you know, conversely, you also have that competitive element. Um, I think, you know, some people are, are more wired that way, but also um, there is, you know, for, for underperformers, people that aren't performing well, um, that social pressure goes both ways. And obviously, you know, I think we all would agree you want that's that's really contingent on culture and making sure mm -hmm. it's not, you know, you're not, uh, you know, making these people feel less than. But I, I have noticed that, you know, for people that are otherwise, you know, maybe not sufficiently motivated that uh, that social side tends to uh, tends to help mm -hmm. and, you know that's that's not top down that's from the culture of an organization so that is you know that's obviously dependent on uh, you know which organization because sometimes that can that can go too far and not be not be a positive thing but for me um, it helps bring up you know the the people that are tend to be a little bit worse performing on those things and of course we want you know everybody to to succeed and to improve. Yeah. I mean, you got to consider, you know, if you see all your friends going to the gym, you know, on social media and you're not, you know, able to go to the gym and, and be the same kind of active person that they are, you know, what does that do? And so there is, you know, again, considering both sides of the motivating uh, uh, stick versus carrot, which one is it? Uh, great insights. Uh, anyone else on the panel that would like to share some, some feedback about the, the LinkedIn poll? If not, I'll hand it back to Scott. All right. Thanks. Nobody in the chat had any uh, questions or comments on that? I did not see anything. And just as a reminder to anyone in the chat, if you do have any questions or, or feedback that you'd like to put forward, just uh, drop it in there or message me and I will bring it to the panel's attention. Um, Thea actually just said, considering organizational culture is essential to determining the success of different methods of motivation. Yep. 100%. So perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Off to Scott. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess uh, to round this uh, part of the discussion out, um, what I'd like to think about is different levels of behavior that we're talking about. So we might be talking about the policy level, right? So in an organization, there are certain policies that people have to comply with. And there are always sections in a policy that talk about consequences. And if people don't comply with the policy, then there are consequences. And so I think sometimes there has to be a stick uh, at the very highest level um, where, you know, from a governance point of view, it's part of the the actual uh, running of the organization. But when you get to another level, we're talking about user experience or employee experience. And I think that goes to what Thea was saying. Um, we actually have to use more positive and less direct um, motivators. And what I was going to do here is actually share with you um, a little bit more about that model that I was telling you about uh, Octalysis. And the reason I want to do that is because when I talk about employee experience, it's what we actually built into the ClickArmor platform. And it might seem like a little bit of a commercial, but this is really a great example of how we've used the Octalysis model uh, to be a more positive and inclusive experience. And the reason it's called Octalysis, I think, in the last slide I showed you, is that there are eight what they call core drives or psychological drivers. And it's really an interesting model because you can actually look at each one and say, yeah, I can I can recognize or, or identify a number of techniques that would allow me to move in that direction or, or pull that lever for uh, the motivator. So just quickly around the, the circle, uh, meaning it's talking about uh, having purpose and some kind of overarching narrative. Like you can actually put people in a, in a little bit of a story of their own uh, and set the context. And sometimes the context is really important for people to understand. First of all, why, why are we doing this training? Why do we want them to, you know, take these actions? And so having a bit of a context for it really helps people just get started and, and think about even participating. 
Next are some of the other game mechanics that we use, like progress and accomplishments at, at multiple levels, whether you're within a question uh, in a uh, quiz or whether you're uh, trying to get, um, you know, finished a course and you get some points or some progress uh, to the end of that uh, course. There's also empowerment. Um, to allow people to explore. We uh, give somebody the ability to say, you know what, I got the question right, but I can actually go in and get some more points if I explore and learn some more. Uh, there are avatars where you can give people a chance to um, choose their own uh, personality, really, uh, graphically, uh, in the form of an avatar, and choose their own name, which could give them some little sort of inside joke with other people, you know, that people have to try and guess. It makes it a little bit more mysterious. Uh, the leaderboard, as, as Jim talked about, it's really um, a, a very important social influencer that uh, people, not everybody says they're a gamer, but a lot of people I find really expect that they will be in the top half of the organization when it comes to performance. And if they see that they're not, there's actually a bit of a motivator for that. Um, as Sid said, sometimes, you know, certain perspectives people might have might seem like a stick. But I find in general, you know, this kind of uh, construct really does motivate people. Uh, other drivers would be things like randomized challenges. So people don't get the same thing every time. They can't just click through. Um, they'll see something different and it drives a little bit of curiosity. And then finally, having the uh, sort of fear of loss, which is a, another kind of negative driver sometimes. Um, I don't want to lose, so I better do this quickly. It's, it's a good motivator in the short term, but it doesn't always work in the long term. If you keep doing that, people are going to get tired. So a lot of these motivators that we put in the product are actually a, a, a product of the research that we did in looking at how we can make this model work with a lot of positive types of uh, feedback and motivators. So those are my uh, thoughts around that particular question. So uh, the next thing I wanted to do was actually launch a poll, if I can find my polls thing, here we are. Um, and then we can get everybody to participate in this. So which of these do you believe is the greatest barrier to using more carrots? You know, we all say we would love to use more carrots. We'd like to have a more positive and inclusive experience. But sometimes we just can't. And uh, there's always a reason. So what do you folks think is the biggest reason why we don't do more carrots? Yeah, and uh, also feel free to put your others in the chat. I can read those out um, while we have a minute here as well. Um, John from the chat said, question, uh, when we talk about carrot and stick, are we talking about security awareness or the wider uh, security team? In my opinion, the security awareness team shouldn't have any sticks. Uh, our job is to build an engaging and positive security culture. Leave punishment to HR slash compliance. There used to be a no one's friend, <laughs> smiley face emoticon. <laughs> I mean, it's a very valid point. You know, everyone's yep. already has that connotation, understanding and fear of HR compliance because it's been good guy, bad guy for years. So, you know, if you are in the security awareness team and, and maybe this is something, oh, Aaron's got her hand up, um, you know, that she could speak to and, and Jim that, yeah, you know, should we just have a good guy, bad guy mentality and or good cop, bad cop and, and, and let it unfold that way. Um, Jim agreed in the chat and, and yeah, so, uh, Aaron, you're first. Um, so I will always believe in staying as posy as possible. Um, I think that approaching anything with positivity and trying to build that bridge between the organization and security should always stick to being more optimistic and uplifting as possible. However, I do think there is a balance to be struck. And the reason I was so interested in answering this question too is... Um, it's interesting when we talk about sticks, uh, I think a lot of people jump to bonuses being docked and, uh, privilege access being taken away and all these technical pieces being implemented. But I also think a lot of people forget to think that a stick could simply be CCing their manager on something. And it can just be simple and clean to say, Hey, you have not completed your awareness training, which I get is five hours long. And we're trying to change that we get the pain, but you do need to complete it. And just as a little push, which is a stick because, you know, you don't want your manager to think badly of you, just see seeing your manager on it. Mm -hmm. That is my job. My job is to make sure that it's not always sunshine and rainbows over here, but we need to make sure that not only are we creating a program that encourages people to want to participate and engage, but also we have the compliance and audit side too, that we have to 
that we're beholden to. So we need to make sure that people are up to date. And in my particular organization, HR and compliance are not the people to do that. That falls on us. So if we can do that in a way that's gentle and give them a little push, sticks don't have to be so aggressive is I think where I'm going with it. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Sticks, like Scott said, sticks still have to be used. You know, there's always a, a proper ratio and it's how do we balance that ratio to continue to motivate and move our staff forward because we can't let them be stale. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, a little too much stick and they're at the door finding a new job, quiet quitting, posting on social media, destroying your brand. I mean, you know, the, the consequences are there. So uh, Jim, quick comment about this and then I'm going to hand it back over to Scott and uh, we'll move on with the poll results. Yeah, so I I, I, I unfortunately am the anti Aaron in this uh, scenario because I'm, I'm more of, there does need to be that stick in there. But I do agree that it shouldn't be the security teams. In, in my current organization, training falls to our HR teams and compliance on phishing falls to our compliance teams. Uh, and I like that differentiation because that lets me and my team um, be the ones who kind of approach people and go, look, send me or report 8,000 emails you think are phishing emails. We'll go through them. We'll work through them. We'll explain why they are or aren't. Um, but in the end, there has to be a compliance thing, depending on what organization you are in. Some organizations can take people failing a, a phishing, whether a real phishing or a fake phishing test um, often. But if you work in something like, you know, the government or something that's like, a, you know, utilities based, they have to have a lot more strict um, stick per se, because if they go down, if they lose systems, Mm -hmm. uh, even hospitals, you know, people can get hurt. And that's, um, that's what needs to be done. But on the same side is when we're doing these, we have to make sure people are understanding what they're doing and not just doing the motions. I've seen a lot of people who, are great at report at reporting fishes during during phishing tests, um, but in the real life world, they will click a phishing email eight times, and because it doesn't present them with a "Hey, you've accidentally clicked the phishing email," it presents them with a real looking page. They don't think the same way, and the Pavlonian response of reporting that phishing email is not there, and they fall victim to real fishes. Um, so there's a there, there's a there's no right answer here. There's just a lot of balancing you need to pay attention to. And it's hard to do for us as security professionals. Yeah, and I think that's the cross-function uh, aspect of everything. Um, Scott, did you want to talk poll results? Yeah, uh, actually, just quickly while, while we're uh, covering that whole idea of whether or not we can, uh, uh, we wh- who, who has the stick or, <laughs> or who do we give the stick to? Um, I think that's, it's, you know, it came from one of the comments from John and I think it's reflected in Aaron and Jim's comments too, is, you know, they're, they're always, is kind of a way to do it, maybe not so heavy handedly. And I liked John's idea of, you know, leave, you know, the heavy handed stuff to the HR team. Um, that's, it's an interesting way to think about it. You know, if, if we want to be effective security awareness people, do we, uh, try to avoid the sticks as much as possible if we believe that it's, you know, important to have the carrots. But if there is something mandated, you know, the question then becomes, do we fight with the, the head of HR over whether there should be a stick or not, right? They, they probably are maybe in a better position overall to, to decide that. So we have to work with what we've got, you know, and also uh, I liked Aaron's idea around, you know, having a little stick is not always a bad thing. And that actually goes back to the octalysis model. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes you, you can, prod people a little bit with some negativity just to get them to do something, but just don't overuse it. That was kind of the comment I wanted to make. Yeah. Um, and I think having that clear expectation is important. Having a, you know, if you're going to have these sticks, then there should be a policy that under that really explains the sticks in the process, right? So here's the escalation process, be it for, we have it for everything else. So why not have it for security awareness? Um, I think Chris, I'll give you about 30 seconds if you want to jump on comment on this and then we'll, we'll jump, we'll jump back forward. Yeah, it's just, uh, there's an underlying current in all of this. I'm I'm listening to everybody. Um, When when these phishing tests and other tests are done, obviously from an early age, we try, we have a desire to learn as much as we can. And obviously we like to shine and et cetera. But it's interesting when these uh, phishing tests or other things are done and we're deciding to use a carrot or a stick, have we gone back to the basics first and made sure 
that the people were targeting, do they understand what fishing is, what fishing is, what smishing is, what spear fishing is, and all of a sudden they're being tested on it. And interestingly, as we're finding out as uh, time goes on and people are now born with that additional appendage called a cell phone. Um, and by age two, they know more than their parents know. Um, and, and I'm not being too facetious because it's starting to turn out like that, but when people feel like they're being tested or whatever, and then they're being judged, how do they come forward and say, well, actually, I hate to admit this, but I don't even really understand what it was I was being tested on. I don't think people ever come back and say that because now they're humiliated. They feel less than, and then you get other people who go through the test that know everything and anything about technology. And they're just stars every time there's five stars on everything they do. My point being, I think that uh, organizations, when they're looking at the, do I go carrot or go stick say, do our employees or do our people even understand what it is we're testing here first let's go through that education process somehow some way and then do the testing or do it concurrently absolutely great point i mean aaron doubled down said communication is key i think that you know i have to completely agree with that while prepping for the session i reached out to a few uh you know friends and and peers and in different organizations i I, I spoke to someone at a one of canadian's top six banks um and they still have a uh fishing policy that if you fail three times you're subject to dismissal and there is you know different departments are now talking about this the you know there's there's fear out there and it's got so bad between you know the amount of phishing simulations that are happening that uh, the security team actually has to send out emails telling people that these emails are clean. So they're not actually actioning, you know, HR required emails because they assume it's phishing. And, you know, again, through uh, you know, a little bit of research, you start to see there's, there's three things that people do now to avoid falling for a phishing scam. One, they don't respond to emails and they wait for that person to send a second follow-up email. You know? Two, uh, they're forwarding it to non-work accounts in order to open it up. And, you know, this is starting to open up these like different can of worms from a security point of view, from compliance, from some all different things. So the more that we incorrectly use these sticks and these safeguards, uh, to Chris's point, if people don't know what they're, you know, up against in the first place, we're just forcing them to make even more errors, which, you know, is, is going to cost the organization at some point. And sorry, Uh, if I can just say one last thing to your point, Ryan, if you don't understand it, but your HR department or whomever it is, is testing you and you realize you have to answer every question that strikes a fear into people and, and, and makes them even more apprehensive thinking, well, I have to answer all of these 10 questions. I don't even know what I'm answering. So they just click on something. Then they come back with the results and say, oh, this person here is clicking on things they shouldn't click on and we need to do something. And then do bring the stick in. So, you know, to the whole point again, um, let's make sure that they understand what it is they're being tested on and why it's being done. And one last point to this, um, do we ever actually sit down with people and say, do you realize the ramifications of clicking on something through the organization? How often is that ever done? You may mistakenly click on something. Do you realize that that might give a uh, cyber criminal access to our accounting department, to our shipping department, to our human resources department? And they say, oh, I didn't know that. I was just clicking on a Air Canada ad, not to pick on Air Canada or something like that, or an email that came in. I didn't realize I've just opened our entire organization up to cybercrime and potential ransomware. How many people in an organization realize that actually could happen by yeah, clicking and, on something? And that's the communication is key. Okay. I think in the interest of time, we probably yeah. want to jump to the next point uh, mm-hmm. just to keep this flowing today. And uh, thank you for all your feedback, everyone. Yeah, so uh, just wanted to uh, look at poll number three, which we launched a few minutes ago, and uh, I closed it. Uh, which of these do you believe is the greatest barrier to using more carrots? Uh, so budget for awards uh, was 22%. Time for creating positive program elements, 39% was the highest. Uh, top level management beliefs was 33%, so up there as well. Uh, and there were there's one other um input. I don't know if we had it on the uh, chat, but um, those were the ba- barriers to using carrots that uh, mm-hmm. we had in the poll. Any I think thoughts to expand, on that? Yeah, I think just to expand on the time one, I just read a comment from the chat. Um, AJ said, it's tough to get people engaged if they're pressed on a thousand other tasks that are seemingly priority one and critical to their work. I think a genuine approach from the upper echelon of the business is realizing most workdays are filled with high priority garbage and removing that would leave more time for important awareness training. 
It is a, a valid point, right? I mean, and uh, Thea made a point to this as well. You also have to assess the weight of the carrots and the sticks in response to security behavior relative to the weight of the carrots and sticks relative product relative to productivity. So it's like, which one do we want? Do we want productivity? Do we want security? Which tasks are more important? And it's this constant balancing act that I think is the theme from each one of our kind of questions and topics of, of, of today's session. Yeah, so uh, I did finally find find my third uh, poll question. It was actually going to be the first one, but uh, it doesn't really matter the order. Um, this poll question is, do you believe employees can be properly motivated without negative reinforcements or sticks? Um, and so it's a pretty simple question, either you believe it or, or not. Uh, but uh, the, the options are never, sometimes, often, or always. So um, anybody want to comment on these from the poll or from the panel? Jim. Jim? So, so, you know, once again, it's like we talked about at the beginning, it, it all depends on who the person is. Um, some people take it on without a problem. Some people, you know, they, they, everything's for them. They, they, they're, they're good at, you know, trying to succeed in this role. Um, sometimes people just don't care or don't understand uh, what the ramifications are. Um, so, you know, some people may be motivated better with a stick and some people may be motivated more with a carrot. And then there's always the third option, which you have a group of people in the middle who, regardless of carrot or stick or a giant carrot shaped stick, they're, they're, you're just not going to get them on board. So it all, it's all understanding your organizational culture and where people skew. Yeah, super valid point. It's also what are those what are those carrots doing, right? Because some people say that monetary carrot just forces people into uh, you know reporting way too much because they're just trying to you know earn some credits or dollars or points in the right? system. Yeah, yeah, in the system, and so then you get this overreported, this over eagerness, um, and that's why it comes back to okay, well maybe you just do it on recognition. Right. But now when you you look at today's day and age, maybe monetary is the driver because everyone's, you know, the economy is where it's at and every dollar counts and stuff. So it's reading, I think, the the pulse of the organization and your people. Totally agree with that, Jim. Uh, Aaron. So it's funny because this actually I raised my hand before, but this kind of fits into it now. Um, I a point that I want to bring up, too, is that I feel like we talk about our problem children <laughs> a lot and especially upper management sometimes thinks that that pool of people is larger than it actually is so i did analysis in my last organization to show in a 12 month period where we fish every month um how many people actually clicked three times within a year or it was like 33 percent of how many people clicked like a third of the time within a year and it came down to 12 people, one of which was myself, because I tested every fishing simulation. So like we can take me and my boss out. It's so easy out of 20,000 people in my last organization to just reach out to those nine people and say, hey, what, what do you just not care <laughs> to Jim's point? Like, do you just not care? Mm -hmm. Or is there something going on? Do you just have a bunch of garbage in your day that, you know, is there something we can do in awareness to make the process easier for you? So going back to like communication is key, when we realize that the pool of people that aren't changing their behavior isn't as large as some people may think it is, you actually do have some of that time to go and actually ask the questions and understand and then adapt your process to make sure it works for them. And mm -hmm. to Chris's point too, also asking them, do you know we fish? <laughs> do you know what a fishing test is? Do you know how... Um, how damaging it can be to you, to the organization, monetarily, um, reputationally. So yeah. it's wonderful to be able to have those conversations with our problem children. <laughs> I think, no, it's a great point too. I'd love to hear from someone, even if we're in the pan, you know, not in the panel, but in the chat of an organization that doesn't have a dedicated security awareness team. See, because I, because I understand like, you know, you have a passion for this, you have the communication, you have the time to talk to those nine people and have those conversations to try. But a lot of organizations, they don't have this and they're running those fishing simulations from, you know, different departments and they're just going to look at results and they make decisions, right? And so that's where, yeah, in an ideal world, when we have, uh, you know, a beautiful team around it with people that understand the human element can do it. But what happens in those other organizations, like a major bank in Canada that doesn't care, that will simply take 
take those 12 people and dismiss them because they're replaceable. And that saves the bank more time, money, and safety than working one-on-one -on -one with those 12 people. Just, you know, I don't necessarily agree with that policy, just being devil's advocate on that as well. Um, so and Ryan, yeah. I will acknowledge that I come from a place of privilege here where I have been a dedicated person or work on a dedicated team to cyber awareness, which I think if anybody works for organizations that don't, you should really encourage them that if you want to see human behavior change, you really need a dedicated human behind it. And that's where that passion comes from. You have to make yeah. security yeah. human again for people. You can't. I, I just really want to want to highlight what Aaron just said, because, you know, one of the things that we're going to do at the end of these sessions is sort of highlight some of the major insights for executives, for managers, and for individuals. And I think that's a really important insight for executives. Make sure that you've got a dedicated security awareness person if you can afford it at all, because it's such a huge uh, difference when somebody's got their time divided. And uh, it's a bit of a clue because next session, we're going to be talking about something about, you know, a day in the life of a security awareness manager. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, Tyler, uh, you've got your hand up. I just I wanted to uh, to follow up on Aaron's point about the uh, you know the problem children right because um, it really is you know af if you're in you know in my case where uh, you know working with organizations that are you know sometimes smaller um, and don't have the resources for dedicated security staff or uh, security awareness staff um, you know we normally that's that's delegated to, to someone on the IT team or outsourced to us and, and we fill that role. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've sort of seen the same conclusions where uh, there's a very small amount of people that you know we're seeing that are that are routinely failing these things. And what it what it go comes down to for me is figuring out if it's one of two things: do they not care? In which case, I think if someone just doesn't care, that's when sticks tend to be a little bit more motivating because you know typically that apathy you know kind of transcends security awareness. It's rarely just a a one time thing. Or do they not understand? Because you can punish someone as much as you want. If they don't understand, the, the, nothing's going to change. And you have to address those people fundamentally differently, right? Um, because, you know, I, you, the, the, the person that doesn't understand, there's, there's an education, there's some other need that's not being met. Um, that, that, you know, on our part as the security team or people working in awareness that, that we would address fundamentally differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other comments from the, the panelists at this time? If not, I'll hand it back over to Scott. Yeah, so uh, just re reviewing our uh, poll results uh, that um, people completed. Uh, our question was, do you believe employees can be properly motivated without negative reinforcements or sticks? Um, nobody said never. 37% uh, said sometimes, 26% said often, and 37% said always. Um, so there's a strong contingent of people who feel you can always get the, uh, the job done without negative reinforcement. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, but I think for some of us, it is a challenge. Um, and that's a really interesting uh, poll result. Uh, Chris, did you have some feedback on the poll? Oh, you're on mute, my friend. There you go. Sorry. No, it's funny. It, it, if you go to somebody who, um, uh, to Tyler's point, uh, people are apathetic to it, or uh, if people think that they are uh, the problem, one approach is to say, you're not actually the problem. You're part of the solution. You're part of the team. For people to say, well, we've got an IT department. That's what they do, right? They've got firewalls and they check this and check that. And you can say, well, they can't check everything. So, you know, you can, you as the end user, can actually be part of the solution here. We need to see that things are happening, or if you're not aware of, of uh, some of the risks or whatever, let us know. And then that helps us as the IT department or whomever understand weaknesses in our, our philosophy of how we're trying to make this a cyber safe organization. So I think by reaching out and encouraging people that they're actually, they can be part of the solution and not necessarily just the problem is a nice carrot to, to put out instead of beating with a stick. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Great insight. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, any other comments or questions about our polls? Checking the chat, checking the chat. No, we're all good. Oh, then there's Sid. Sid, the floor is yours. I, I just like to say, um, uh, um, piggybacking on what Chris said, any stick can be positioned as a carrot. 
yourself. So, um, you know, the way you approach things, as Aaron said, there can be uh, small uh, motivators. And if you think all uh, 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 negative motivators, you know, whether they're small or not, matter. Um, yeah. Anything you see as a negative thing can be turned into a positive. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would not disagree with that at all. I, I like that philosophy. I mean, you know, Thea in the chat said, yes, said explanation mark. I think that uh, there is a lot to that of, of how do we, you know, if we're going to have a ratio of sticks to carrots, we have to, we've all decided that that's kind of the balance we need to make. Well, how do we turn those sticks into a little bit more carrot like devices, right? So yeah, it's, it's positive reinforcement. It, you know, it's all these things that we know from psychology that uh, have been in place for hundreds of years. Um, but for when it comes to security awareness, for some reason, we just seem to miss it all and uh we throw we kind of throw it out and we, we we need to start from scratch but i think we've learned how to motivate humans uh and what works and what doesn't so great point sid um danny the floor is yours yeah just one thing i was thinking we're we're talking about sticking carrots um like who does that like is it hr is it who but really often it's between people between teams so the carrots come from the others and working together um as a team you just get rewarded by the others because you're doing something together so we don't need like a money or whatever. It's just really the reward from your mm -hmm. peers that is not necessarily a leaderboard or anything. It's just like doing it together and achieving something together too. Yeah, that's a great point, Danny. I mean, that's almost kind of creating a, a bit of a network, um, you know, uh, within you know, your organization of, of just people that are security champions that are proud of their work. And I mean, it happens in, in all other departments. So again, why can't it happen in security awareness? You know, when people land a big deal in the sales department, everyone congratulates everyone and the, you know, the team is pumped and, you know, it's a, it's a let's win together kind of vibe. So let's, you know, move that into security awareness. It's, you know, I'm not suggesting like when you report a phishing email, you jump up in your chair, like you just won the Super Bowl. But I mean, there, you know, there can be that, that positive reinforcement. A, it, it's going to make your day go better. It's going to build a better team and culture and, and everything else. And yeah, it's going to be a free carrot. Um, and that those are the important things because we're all going to talk about time and budget. This is why we can't get anything done in cyber, right? The same two things come up over and over, time and budget. So how do we get around that? And we find we have to find the time, we have to make the time, we have to make the priority of it, and we have to find ways to you know reward people and encourage people without having to spend money. I, I agree. Erin? Um, I also would just say it to everybody too, just to never underestimate the gold star method here. I'm the queen of the gold star method. If you just tell me I did a good job on something, my motivation spikes past a hundred percent. Like I can't wait to keep impressing you. <laughs> so yeah. I think too, like that can just be the easiest thing to send a little email that says, good job. You reported, like keep up the good work, yeah. security team, whatever it is. The gold star method is the easiest and freest way <laughs> to motivate people. And it works super, super well. Yeah, shameless plug, but with Click Armor, one of my favorite features is when you're done an assessment and it pops up, it'll tell you what you did wrong, of course, but we also tell you what you did right. And we break down exactly why you made that decision, um, you know, and, and what led to that. So you make a better decision next time. It's rather than a hunch, it's more now you have that education behind you. Uh, Chris, I'll give you 30 seconds to wrap this and I'll hand it back over to Scott to continue on as we're running. Yeah, just to just time. Just a quick point to Aaron's point, um, but you want to be careful if you have a, a a sales board type scenario there with the gold stars, you want to be careful that one person or two people aren't the only ones getting five stars all the time. I think that's extremely demotivating to everybody else. And indirectly, it's a form of a stick. I'm not against the five star principle. Everybody likes to get it, but we got to be careful that the same people aren't the only ones getting the five stars all the time. Yeah. For sure. Um, I'm just going to share a little thing that uh, reflects, I think, what uh, something that Danny was saying. Um, it's a LinkedIn post that I did earlier this week, actually. Um, and it was talking about uh, not only uh, sticks or carrots, but um, there was an article I read in Harvard Business Review by Lisa Lai. And she had a really good quote that said, motivation is less about employees doing great work and more, more about employees feeling great about their work. Um, and I think that's really important. If it, the enjoyment of the actual experience is as much a reward as anything that you can give them in terms of stars or points. Uh, so something I think is, is really important. 
So with that, um, we are getting close to the end. I'm just going to wrap up with a, a little bit of a commercial for Click Armor, but uh, this is something I think is uh, pretty uh, good value for people uh, in the area of what we're talking about, trying to add some something new and exciting and different. Um, we announced this a, a couple of months ago, our Security Awareness Month pack, which is really just a series of four three-minute challenges uh, that are really easy to deploy uh, for just $99, regularly $4.99. And it's really something you could do over the four-week period uh, during October Security Awareness Month, um, just to get people engaged, doing something a little more positive and to remind them about security. So just wanted to mention that. Um, there's a QR code here that uh, will take you to the page where you can learn more about that offer. And uh, Click Armor really in, uh is very thankful that everybody was able to come today. Uh, our next session, uh, I hope the QR code works here. I just did it as I was <laughs> preparing for the session. So our next session in two weeks uh, will be on a day in the life of a security awareness manager. We sort of touched on that today uh, a little bit with Aaron, and uh, it'll be really fun to have uh, all of you back again, uh, whether you're in the panel or just able to join us in the chat. Um, we'd love to learn about you know the things that you find as the typical chat tasks, the challenges, Especially if your your job isn't dedicated to security awareness, what else are you doing? What, what you know? What are the things that are taking your mind off of this stuff um, that could be a challenge, and maybe some uh, ways for people to help uh, you be more productive? Um, so that's our uh, our session in two weeks. I really hope everybody can join us. Um, with that, I'm going to. Uh, wrap it up and just say thank you to all of our panelists and all of the people who joined us uh, in the chat. Uh, hope you got uh, good value from this and I look forward to seeing you next time uh, in two weeks. Thanks everybody. Yeah.